So I, I'm so delighted to have you here today, Meg. Um, I, I, just to start out, I think it, it's helpful for the audience. If you could just tell us a little bit about the person who, who yeah. is talking yeah. to us today and, and, you know, how did you get to do what you do? <laughs> Well, can we talk about grace and <laughs> other good no, influences that's, that's beyond me? And all of those things, right, yeah. One of the things I've realized, and I think this is important, is I never felt stopped by circumstances. And, and I had an extremely powerful grandmother, Irma Lindheim, who was a great feminist leader for the creation of the state of Israel and her influence on me is it grows. Um, and uh, she was alive until I was 35. So it was a big influence, but also I just had very good fortune in that when I felt I should do something, it, it became possible. It wasn't a question of money or status it was just a real sense of yeah I can do this and sometimes people would tell me well you don't know how close it was <laughs> that we didn't accept you into Harvard and such but it was like I always had the sense of good fortune but also tied to great curiosity mm -hmm. and, well, that's what I was going to ask you right there when you said good fortune I was going to say do you really think it was good fortune or what else no would... I think it was karma yeah. actually <laughs> no seriously yeah, yeah. I do I've always been curious and I've always had a great mind. I mean, I didn't know I had a great mind until people started telling me that because you just think, well, everyone understands these things. So, and I was able to go out into the world and live in different cultures, but like I went into the Peace Corps in 1966 in post-war career. So one could say that was an act of courage. I just thought it was the right thing to do. <laughs> and uh, it was. I learned profound truths about being part of the, of the human family, even in a totally foreign culture. And then I had great teachers, just wonderful teachers both academic and spiritual. So, and in the midst of it, I raised a very large family because I married a widower who had five children, aged five to 16. And wow. then we added two more. So it was seven kids. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> but I sort of ran it like an organization for a while. You know? But I've just been blessed. I mean, really, and I'm blessed right now with sufficient health to keep going. And uh, it, it's it's interesting as you as you describe your story. I'm thinking when you mentioned the word karmic. I mean we we don't talk about that very much, right? We we kind of hide that under the table. But so, what do you think was karmic about your journey? I'm just curious. Oh, this is a much longer but intriguing <laughs> conversation. I I believe, um, and you have to understand that I've been a Tibetan Buddhist and now am with an Indian yogi uh, for, I don't know, 40 years. So this is not a trivial statement when I say it's karmic. I've just been prepared for this particular life of dealing with leadership and leaders and being out in the world. Um, and that comes from many past life experiences and I had to deal with all the negative things I've done as well but I just had entree and I had acceptance and I had curiosity yeah and great teachers great teachers so yeah I mean I know that's a whole other it is <laughs> you could talk about right um but I bring it up because I think it's so relevant to what we're going to be talking about today as we talk about the about a little bit, we go a little deeper and talk about things like consciousness yeah. and and those things which we often sometimes ignore or don't understand. Uh, but I know you wrote the iconic book um, Leadership in the New Science, where okay. you started to bring some of these things early on into leadership. You know, in terms of quantum theory, right. etc. And that was a while back, and it was tremendously successful at the time. Yes, so. Well, I'm going to ask you what motivated you to write that book at that time. And okay. I'm just going to stay in the mystic zone with you. Yeah, I really, I, I, want to, I want to hear. And also what were you, what message? Obviously there's a, a really strong message in that book that you were trying to convey. 
that so I did not understand. That. Yeah. I so talk that. about that a little. Okay. I just finished my 12th book, which is called Restoring Sanity, <laughs> right on the heels of Who Do We Choose to Be, which is a new book, second edition. They just came out in June. Um, and the reason I can write books so quickly and so well is that I never write a book until it tells me to write it. So I'm instantly in a relationship, not with my own desire for fame or attention, but for, I get a clear message that this book is here, you're the author of it, and then it becomes a vehicle for me to bring in all my experience. So I'm not channeling books, but right. the book has a clear uh, voice for me when I start to write it. Well, with leadership in the new science, I was so fascinated by chaos theory and quantum theory. Um, but I got it right in that book. But now I know what I didn't know <laughs> when I wrote it. Um, but I have to say, my naivete at that point, and this is a major learning, is I thought good ideas with evidence <laughs> changed thinking. Mm -hmm. So I thought when leaders would read of how much power there is in organizing for free, setting up the conditions for self-organization the way that all life does, with great evidence for increased productivity, outstanding motivation, real connection to purpose and meaning in the work uh, without rules and regulations just completely oppressing us. Um, I thought that would be a slam dunk mm -hmm. and it wasn't. <laughs> so that was the beginning of my own journey. And I wrote about it in subsequent editions of Leadership in the New Science of what it takes to change a paradigm. And uh, now we are so far beyond any possibility of changing the paradigm, changing the way we operate. So I'm just fast forwarding us now, yeah. 30 years later, <laughs> um, to Leadership in New Science came out in 1992. When I wrote Who Do We Choose to Be, which is about facing reality, claiming our leadership, and restoring sanity, I wrote that using the same science to describe where we are today. And then the second edition that's just come out, same title, but completely new book in, inside, because I kept noticing where we are. And that's been, I would say, that's the gift of insight that I both was given and developed over many, many years and experiences. So where we are now, compared to where we were 30 years ago, is an entirely new um startlingly destructive time oh. and uh and what's the common denominator in your opinion there's a obviously there's a common obviously there's humanity there right i mean is there what is the common denominator that is there well we could start we could start with our humanity because i think um this new book restoring sanity will come out in march next year and it's about how do we work with the human spirit? Because we have our animal nature, our neurobiology that is all predetermined how we respond to fear. And that is truly a reptilian brain, right? It's very primitive and it's automatically stimulated when we're in fear. The other side of our nature, which takes work is our human consciousness and it's not just about taking the time to activate our frontal lobes where we hold all our qualities for vision contemplation imagination innovation all the things we say we want we cannot access that unless we are deliberately focused on becoming conscious, on reducing the things that trigger us, of really wanting to be not locked into this denial 
or not locked into this feeling of I have to protect myself because it is a terrible world out there. That is the common explanatory, and the other common explanatory is leadership, how leaders behave. So we're now living in a time of complete narcissistic greed and self-protection from the elites. And I have to bring in here the pattern of history, which is something I rely on now, of what every civilization goes through manifests in its last stage. Mm -hmm. We are in the last stage. It's a global calamity. But one of the things that characterizes that time is that the elites grab everything for themselves. They don't care about us. You look at all these decisions and behaviors and it's pure self-service at a corporate greed level. It's pure self-service at a at a political level. I mean, there's no other understanding that I think that's possible except to see our political and corporate leaders are just trying to claim everything for themselves and to hell with the rest of us, to hell with the planet. So leaders have always striven to amass power and wealth. I mean, that's human history. I'm pretty well informed now i mean i had a major in history i've never lost that mm -hmm. fascination so if we're looking for common denominators first is human nature and second is leadership and how it manifests itself we always create civilizations empires that are hierarchical that's just part of the human dna and we always create structures infrastructures courts of law, art, religion, and we always create beauty. But the beauty of the artist is usually expressed at the end, mm -hmm. not in the midst of a civilization. It's not part of its flowering, actually. It's part of the last expression. So we have common denominators in the pattern of history of civilizations. We have common den denominators of how do humans behave you know just wherever we are this is not culturally dependent um and then how do leaders always behave so how do can consciousness be elevated can that change or is it just the demise individual of consciousness definitely i mean i wouldn't be doing all my right. spiritual practice right. or none of these uh, spiritual teachers would be out there um so it's individual consciousness that changes. There are a few rare instances that I'm aware of, of whole cultures that became conscious and left en masse. They just enlightened <laughs> themselves. Right. Um, there's a, Those stories exist in Tibetan history for sure. But what's the need here? So the book title, who do we choose to be? Mm -hmm. We take, the, we the take, operative word is choice. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. the three subtitles remain essential. So we have to face reality. And that's incredibly fearful and terrible and saddening. I mean, Stephen Jenkinson, who's a great philosopher, has spoke, written a lot about aging. He's a good teacher. He said, if you wake up to what's going on at this time, you wake up with a sob. So of, our hearts are completely forever broken once we wake up to what's happening to so many people, so much devastation to other species, to habitat, and to us humans. I mean, you just read the headlines any day now every day right Absolutely. and it's just overwhelming so and then we're trying to we're trying to attribute that every time i see something like this we attribute it oh it's because of, we had covid and people are not you know and yeah, i don't, or <laughs> the news right <laughs> it's, and everybody's losing their mind or something or the media is just feeding us bad news right like no, well that's a whole 39 year old son the other day it's like oh come on nico <laughs> um, <laughs> right 
But once we face reality, then we make a decision. This is where choice comes in. Do I just want to withdraw like the majority of the population? This is called the age of distraction, the age of entertainment in the last stage, where people just, you know, uh, get lost in Netflix, get lost in entertainment. Um, and and it's self-protection. I actually understand that dynamic now. But if you want to play a role, if you want to be supportive, helpful, compassionate, and not just go for self-protection. So that's the choice. Am I going to go just to self-protect myself and my family? Or am I going to choose to want to serve this time? And then the question of how do I serve this time? And that's where I come in as with, we need to think of ourselves as warriors. for Yeah. So, so I'm going to stop you there because I want to, I want to, I want (laughs) to emphasize that one because I love that so much. Um, It's almost, you know, almost synchronistic because I I talk about that a little bit. I talk about spirit warriors and when I read your um, work, I thought, oh my gosh, um, Talk a little bit about what a warrior of the human spirit is and how you- A warrior for the human spirit is a sane human being wanting to serve an insane, inhumane time. Mm -hmm. And that requires enormous skills. It requires enormous inner capacity to- to be able to stay, I mean, we have the commitment to stay and to be in places where we are needed. We're needed for comfort, we're needed for possibility, we're needed for compassion, solace, all of those things within our, wherever we're leading. I'm still focused on leaders and activists, okay? Yep. Although many, many people respond to this. In order to stay engaged and not get swept up in the increased fear, negativity, and aggression, we have to work on ourselves. But we're not doing that to become more peaceful people. We're become doing that to become a more peaceful presence yep. for other people. And there's no doubt in my mind whatsoever, because I've now been training warriors for six years, when we can be there and not get so easily triggered, not, you know, this is hard work, right? You're in a meeting, you're in a family situation, and suddenly everyone around you is angry and flying off the handle, and you find yourself suddenly filled with aggression and anger or fear. Well, you have to be able to have trained yourself this is a level of consciousness. Train yourself enough to notice, oh, I'm just getting really angry here. What do I do? I don't want to add to the aggression or fear that's in the room or in the situation. So we learn practices. Some of them are very Buddhist. Some of them are just e- e- eternally helpful practices for many traditions. So I have combined my work on leadership with my spiritual practices. And I'm very grateful to be yeah, able to and, do and, that. And it's interesting how, what we've done. I mean, I, I work in leadership development, as you know, for you know almost 30 years now. And so uh, it's interesting how we separate those things that you know, there's, so it's mind, body, spirit, right? It's no, no, it's just mind. It's just the prefrontal cortex where, whereas, you know, there's also the spirit part of us, right? The divine part and whatever, however you want to call it. I mean, it doesn't matter what the label is. So let's stay with this for a minute, because this is something that, you know, I've been in leadership. I just added it up as 50 years, which just shocks me. But, um, There was all that work on spiritual leadership in the 90s on on building community within uh, organizations. And all of it came up short because organizations have their own values and their own needs. And it's nothing about spirituality or compassion necessarily. 
I worked with a few leaders who were very set on creating that that depth of experience. But where are we now? So now, you know, 30 years later, this is a personal choice that I need more grounding. I need more depth, more understanding of what makes for a meaningful life, right? I mean, because we're now, all of of the measures of success, profitability, material goods, healthy kids, all of those things now are falling short for enough people that they're turning to, okay, what else is there? There has to be more, right? There has to be more to life. Every spiritual tradition answers that question of meaning. Where I am interested in is, yes, let's develop our spiritual depth so that we can use it in service to others. But see, that's a different leap. It's not, we all become highly conscious and we'll change our organization. No, but it's in service of. What's it in In service service of? Of a bigger collective. No, I'm I'm with you. Totally with you. And I I do think that's an important historic shift where we're trying to get our spiritual grounding inside our work. And now it's our spiritual grounding that creates our work. It helps us focus on who needs me, what's needed here, how could I contribute, even though it's not going to change the global scene. I mean, I'm insisting we all go local. Um, because you know, it, it's, it's, I, I'm just, it's fascinating to me um, in, in a lot of the executive coaching work I do. One of the things that people always say to me is what is, you know, what do I do here? What do, what do I do here? And my, my question always back is what I call the magic question, which you just said it was what is needed here. Right. It's not about you. Fabulous. <laughs> it's about yeah. what is needed here. And that's yeah. where you move from. Not from and I, <laughs> right, right. And, and the how do they how do they respond to that? They love it. Okay, love it. I mean, it's actually it's calming. I think yeah. the response is, oh, <laughs> like that pressure is not all on me. I need to move myself out of it. Um, and so I think there's something big there. What I think we're talking the same thing yeah. is about moving out of that ego consciousness or whatever you want to say into a more collective of what of service and you know how can i contribute versus it's me yes. and what how, what do i prove and all of that i mean there's a big yes. piece of that in what you're saying and or one of the right. things we gain from any spiritual tradition or most all of them is that uh i'm just an insignificant player in a vat i mean do we need the web telescope any more photos from the web telescope to convince us that we're living in an incomprehensible universe of two trillion galaxies wait a minute yeah, i get the no, goosebumps but- it's funny because i work with people who are who um created the web telescope you know the wow. company that created it. and and uh it's interesting even these you know brilliant minds we're still all struggling with the same stuff, right? And so when you see that, it has to be sobering. It has to to open up a window for us, right? I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. You bring that up. Well, and- it does. And I think the window that was, uh, was defined by Carlos Castaneda in his books relating Don Juan, the Aki shaman, uh, many, many years ago, who said, you know, understand that how in i'm not quoting but this yeah, is yeah. all right understand that we are totally insignificant and this is the most important thing i can be doing right now oh. and to hold those you don't need to resolve them but when you ask what's needed here rather than what will make me feel meaningful or purposeful right. it's an entirely different locating yourself in your immediate reality with the skills that you have and offering them even though 
it really wouldn't matter if the whole Milky Way galaxy disappeared right now, you know? Right. So I, I love being in both sensibilities, like right here, right now, what's needed from me? What's the best use of me? Um, and with, I mean, it's, it's not even humility when you contemplate the size of the, of this universe or our complete ignorance of how it's all working. Um, you know, and I still, and I think there's something in what you just said that, and I want to, I want to highlight that, that, the complete ignorance, because I think we are trained and especially so many people who are sitting listening to this, you know, in leadership positions that I have to, I know everything, you know, I'm the, no, I, I'm the all knowing. Or I'm expected. Or I'm expected to know everything, right? And the reality, what you just said is that we're all operating in in complete ignorance (laughs) on some level. I mean, I love what you just said. Um, Yeah. Well, our ignorance is boundless. Yeah. Quite a wonderful experience when you don't have to be right. But I want to act with complete understanding that leaders are supposed to know what to do. And that what I'm seeing happening right now is the need for certainty, for outcomes, for schedules and timelines that actually work uh, is being pushed down in the organization through many levels of hierarchy because the leader feels he or she, I'm just going to say he here, must be certain. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there is no certainty. And there's never been a better or more necessary time for engagement strategies. But when you're up against the wall as a leader, and you still have to look like you're in control. What's happening is you, I just see pushing the control downward on people, which yeah. completely um, pushes them away and uh, makes their life impossible. And so they leave. I mean, it's this quest for certainty rather than engagement that I think is the fundamental flaw in leadership these days. You know, I, I find that many leaders that I encounter and, you know, I've been in large organizations you know, that we're always looking for the checklist, right? The, the tips, um, the steps, you know, how do I, there's five steps and it's all about, you know, how do I do this better? How do I do this? Sure. And the conversation I think we're having is who you're being and not what you necessarily you're doing is a big part of this. That's part one. That's part one. Right. And so there's a check. So, so what's the checklist for that? What would you say to okay. Lee, this is, looking this for is, a checklist for that? <laughs> this is my new book. I mean, the title is Restoring Sanity. The subtitle, which is the heart of this book, is Practices to Awaken Generosity, Creativity, and Kindness of it. Yeah. in ourselves and our organizations. So the inner work of the leader is having unshakable faith that's developed over time that people can be creative generous and kind but it's the leader's role to have that faith and then work extremely hard most challenging time for leadership ever is how i see it to create conditions so that people's best qualities can come forth and that's all about high engagement strategies now but i'm saying this is not possible in the organization at large it is possible if you intentionally create yourself mentally and how you bring people together as an island of sanity you have to set yourself apart Uh, there's a principle in biology called refugia. These are places that in the midst of fire and volcanoes and floods where life flourishes. And that's that's what I'm proposing as the only possibility now for peoples to work well together. So the inner work of the leader is being able to recognize in him or her and herself 
and in other people that yes, we have these qualities. Now, what can I do to create the conditions? I think it's an enormous challenge. I list it, name it. This is the greatest challenge of your leadership life. I'm going to ask you just a couple more questions just to kind of round this out. As you talk, uh, a lot of the onus is on leaders. And there would there's a lot of literature that would say that everyone's a leader, right? That it's not just a position yeah. of authority. It's not a blah, blah, blah. So how, how would you, you know, and that we are followers, but we're also leaders. Yeah. What, what is your I thought? Would, I would never state that. Okay. So say, because, say about that. Because I think it's, and I have written about this in the past several years, that we're, I have understood that in times of crisis, when people are locked into fear and meaninglessness and don't want to participate, which is, a, I think, a generalizable description of most organizations these days, um, you can't, uh, we need strong leaders. We need high engagement, morally ethical there for people believing in people leaders and in a crisis situation this is born fruit even in indigenous cultures where they have a really flat structure right right, right. um there's everybody always, can't be the leader right there's right. always a leader for the hunt or there's a leader for this or there's a leader for that and right now for me the burden of proof the culpability lies with how leaders are behaving. So you can't say, you know, leaders need to own the just the destructive patterns that they're engaged in. And that's why I'm talking about this as the highest form of courage for a leader. You still believe in people, and that become that's being a warrior for the human spirit. And um, a lot of those old truisms now are just escape statements, you know, because we don't want people to be leaders. We, we just want them to obey us generally in organizations and get the job done. And then we're, we're not taking any responsibility for how disastrously destructive leadership has become. So let me ask you this, you know, as I, on an end note, as we as we round this this conversation out, because there's just so many facets to what you're talking about. We're really talking about change. We're talking about a new way forward. So what advice would you give to leaders who are seeking to step up, be warriors, yeah. be warriors of the spirit and create or lead meaningful change? Well, it's really not about change. It's about survival right now. Mm. Really? Yeah. That's a really good point. Okay. Yeah. So it's not like we're in control and can decide how much change we want to create or create a culture of change. Now, we, you know, organizational cultures need to be maximally adaptive at this point. And the only way you get to be adaptive is if you're using everybody's eyes, ears, and senses to determine what just happened and how are we going to respond to it. Um, I'm, you know, so going back years and years to the concept of a learning organization, learning is a survival strategy now, folks, and there's no way out of it. So for any up and coming leader, first of all, thank you for even contemplating this role because it's not about personal success or making large amounts of money, that's gone. And you can either step up in service to people and, and really feel that is your calling. And then you learn how to do that. But if you're just coming into a leadership position to get along, go along, make your mark within the organization, while the world is, as the UN just said, burning around us and while more and more people are going to be devastated by food shortages and migration doesn't matter if you're in a nice insular corporation you're 
facing these challenges now. We saw it with supply chain, but it's going to get much more extreme. So I'm not interested in people becoming leaders in the old mode. I want people who actually want to serve at this time. And as a warrior for the human spirit on behalf of people, what can I do to make my life meaningful, actually, and not withdraw? Wow. <laughs> what a wonderful, what a wonderful metaphor to leave people with a warrior, warrior for the human spirit. Yes. Uh, looking at it that way. I mean, that's immensely profound. And what a, what a difference that would make if we saw ourselves that way, the leaders that are listening. And these people always arise at the end of a civilization. And we're always few in number because as one historian who tracked this very described it very well said there are always only a few people who understand the need for self-sacrifice to preserve community and they we raise the banner of duty and honor against the depravity and despair of their time wow and that's the hope it's not a hope it's a reality these people are out there and those who are, that's who I'm working with now. Yeah. I meant that's the hopeful message at the end, right? Of your, well, own. let's say it's inspiring. Inspiring. You have to yeah. decide really what, what's your own path going forward. And, you know, I mean, I have one son who's really on the path of making lots of money and doing good with his money but making lots of money building a large home and uh i just watch it i know i'm not going to convince him of anything else and so we can do good service within our professions and still make you know profit from them in the old ways but it's not going to last for long <laughs> and so you know I'm always testing with my sons and with my grandchildren. What are your deepest values here? You know, that will sustain you when all these comforts are not so easily achieved and things are so unstable. So that goes back to spiritual depth and practice. Absolutely. What a wonderful conversation, um, Meg. I, I so appreciate you being here today. This was- a I really appreciate- yeah. this this as a real conversation because we're clearly seeing and even speaking some similar things i just have a you know this very radical view of like <laughs> no I, and i i love it i think it, <laughs> we need to um have a platform to have these conversations so i we so appreciate it